All right, everybody, welcome to the August 2021 event for the Atlanta Kubernetes Meetup. Uh, we are doing a virtual meetup again today, so thank you for coming out and spending time with us. I know everybody's uh, a little tired of virtual events at this point, so we always appreciate that you're willing to do one more to spend time along with us. I don't do, I don't have a count of how many we've done so far, all virtual, but it's been, God, 15, 16. Uh, so we're getting the swing of things finally. Um, as always, we will open up with a call for hiring. If you've got any hiring going on in the community um, for you know, Kubernetes, cloud native related uh, software, any, anything in that field, go ahead and put it into the chat. Uh, make sure you include uh, you know, a link to a job description and contact information for somebody they can hit up at the company to talk to about the role if they're interested. Uh, it's a great resource. We'll, we'll make sure to get these also posted in the show notes. Uh, so they'll be persisted for the future and they'll, they'll go in the recording on YouTube as well. Uh, and I'll read those out after the news. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump over to Joe for the news while we filter those in. All right, let me switch over here. And can everybody see the news section now? Cool. All right, um, bump the font up a little bit more here. So let's start as we usually do by going through um, this month in Kubernetes with the release cycle. We just started the 1.23 release cycle um, this week, actually. Um, so the no real deadlines yet, but the call for enhancements is out. So if you've got some changes upstream that you're looking to get into the 1.23 release cycle, um, now is the time to make sure all your, everything's in order. Um, and this was new to me. I'm not sure if it's been around in, in the past couple release cycles, but I did notice that there's this production readiness review team um, and they are required to review all kits that are going into uh, the release cycle. So um, again, if you do have a release, make sure you've got that scheduled. Um, the enhancement freeze for the 1.23 release is September 9th. So that's coming around pretty quick. Um, and then, yeah, Kubernetes 1.22 was released at the beginning of the month, so uh, kudos to the release team there. Um, there was quite a few, I think somewhere in the round of 50 plus new enhancements added into the 1.22 release. Um, we've reviewed some of them in the um, preceding months as we talked about that release cycle, um, but feel free to go out and check through that. And I got a link that I forgot to add in here, but um, Sysdig actually um, on their blog does a really decent ride covering some of those enhancements and whatnot. So I'll get that added in um, after the show today so you can check that out as well. We did have fixed releases for um, 1.22. We had 1.22.1, um, 1.21.4, and 1.20.10. These are just standard um, fixed releases. Uh, I didn't see any CVEs or security fixes uh, out there. Um, so again, uh, just to reiterate, even though there's an NA here, there definitely were things promoted and deprecated, just none um, to call out. I didn't see any CVEs, so that's awesome. Um, and then PRs of note. So this was a really interesting one, and I felt the need to call this out because one, it's, it's a celebration that the server side apply enhancements have, have come GA in, in upstream Kubernetes. And so um, a slight background here is that um, a lot of the apply operations for Kubernetes historically lived on the client side in your like client go and kubectl type um, uh, binaries and tools. So um, that created some interesting problems that the community learned about over time and they started implementing the server side apply, which gives a lot more context to do things like detect merge conflicts and different things like that. It also brought in the concept of applying ownership to individual fields within resources. So if you have a controller or something of that nature, um, you can kind of track provenance of who changed what and if it's changed by the machine, like who owns that, that particular field. Um, this goes into a little bit of different thing and there's a lot of technical detail here. I'm not gonna act like I understand it all, but one of the reasons why I thought it was cool to call out is um, if you've ever messed around in client go stuff and controllers and whatnot, you can learn quickly how complicated it can be to manage like the full structs of these resources um, as, as billing structs and whatnot. Um, and so, um, especially when you're like do updating specific fields in there um, inside of like a controller reconciler or anything like that. But 
This concept essentially extends some functionality that already existed for core Kubernetes resource types to work uh, for um, custom resource definitions. So um, what this does is it allows you to essentially pass in your, your resource um, and then pass in um, your, your kind of like the, um, your owner name and it will limit the fields available to you to update based on those that you own, which is pretty interesting. So um, it can make some of the changes a little bit more atomic and, and a little more finite versus having to wrangle the full go type um, if you only need to update certain portions of it. So pretty interesting. Uh, moving on into community news, there were a few things that I found that were kind of interesting. Uh, and this is one, uh, so get powered K8's controller. Um, this is very interesting and I will give the same kind of uh, warning that's that's put put in here was like this is totally hacked up and just proving an idea so um you know you, you use it your own risk sort of thing but essentially most kubernetes controllers have um watchers for uh kubernetes resources inside the cluster um and react to changes based on the the, the request to the kubernetes api server um and this flips that a little bit and does a watch on resources in a Git repository and can read and write to um, sort of persist things in that Git repository. So um, this code is definitely POC, but I think it, it presents an interesting uh, kind of uh, problem statement here um, and, and a different paradigm for thinking about how to use the um, really awesome Kubernetes um reconciliation patterns um, for things that might live outside of kubernetes um, but pretty interesting and then uh, we've done a lot of stuff in the past talking about the oci image stuff and this one came across and i thought this was actually pretty cool too especially um you know has some bearings around uh some security concerns with images um so there's a lot of things these days when you build an image typically you're going to start with like a from statement and supply some sort of base image to um, use as, as, the, as the base for all of the things that you layer on top of it or add to it or modify. Um, and historically tracking the provenance when all you have is the image and say not the Docker file um, that define the image can be a little tricky. Um, but this kind of adds, uh, adjust the standards for the OCI definition to add in these base image annotations so that you will have sort of a provenance, not just of the name, but also the digest for the image um, that, that's based on. So that's pretty cool updates there. And then the Kubernetes benchmark operator. So there's a lot of tools out there, like say Sonobuoy for Kubernetes conformance that run through a suite of different scenarios and tests. Can I deploy a pod? How long did it take me to deploy the pod? Can I delete a pod? things of that nature. But there's a lot more nuance when you get into uh, performance benchmarking on Kubernetes. And this has been something that I've, I've worked with um, and I've talked with a bunch of friends and we've all sort of done it differently. Um, so it's, sorry, I don't think that link came up correctly. Maybe I missed the link. Oh, let me see if I can get this up real fast. Sorry about that. Um, but essentially when you wanna take the different like performance concerns inside of a Kubernetes cluster, testing things like network, storage, compute, all of those things independently, this project uh, establishes an operator pattern um, and includes a lot of sort of industry standard tools for doing performance benchmarks on all sorts of things. Um, anything from your, your standard network stuff like iPerf, um, your Sysbench and FIO for um, um, disk type stuff, even into like PGBench for Postgres performance, um, Vegeta for HTTP performance, um, lots of different things here um, to where you can essentially have a single configuration to orchestrate all of these different types of benchmarking utilities in your cluster. So um, lots of cool stuff there. 
Um, I haven't played around with this particular project yet, but it also looks like all of the results of these individual tests can be output in like metrics form um, and metadata form. So really cool thing um, if you're looking to benchmark your Kubernetes clusters. And with that, that'll wrap up the news for this month of August. Um, back over to you, Alex. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. I always get hypnotized watching the lights blink behind Joe with his awesome <laughs> setup back there. Notice the beautiful cabling work there, folks. All right. So for uh, hiring, we've got a few things here. Uh, Andy Holtzman, one of our speakers, uh, posted a platform engineer role for their team at uh, Equinix Metal that manages the uh, team's uh, global Kubernetes platform. Uh, Jeff Spar, or Spare, I apologize if I pronounced that wrong, uh, posted a role for Lenovo. Uh, it looks like it's a DevOps advisory engineer or, or a platform engineer. It looks like that's a, a remote role. And he says you can contact him directly at jspar, that's S-P-A-H-R at Lenovo.com. Again, these will be in the show notes. So don't feel like you have to write that down frantically. Uh, let's see, Krijan, 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 sorry again if I pronounced that wrong, uh, posted a DevOps lead role for global payments. And he says you can email him uh, at uh, Krijan at, a, at gmail dot or rather in the show notes. Uh, and now we've actually got a couple of uh, announcements for local startups that are, uh, are moving through the, uh, the phases of moving up into beta and also looking for customers. So uh, Lawrence, if you want to take a minute and tell folks about what you got going on at Re Real Theory. Hey, cool. Thanks, Alex. And Joe, thanks for the news there. That last one I hadn't heard of. That's very interesting. Um, Real Theory, I'm one of the co-founders. We've been building it for a couple of years. We're using machine learning. Uh, our intent is to use machine learning to build self-optimizing -opti uh, Kubernetes applications. Um, it's a long slog, but we've got the first beta release uh, ready to come out. Um, but we want some the next cohort of testers to come in and test it. Uh, this isn't the one using machine learning, but it's full of intelligence and value. Uh, if you're in the role of an SRE or DevOps uh, developer uh, in a Kubernetes environment. Um, so the request is that you use Kubernetes in some capacity at your day job and uh, you have access to a test cluster. If you're interested in helping out on something that's gonna be a freemium pro product worldwide, uh, we'd love uh, help with that. Uh, you can contact me at LG uh, for Lawrence Guillory, LG at realtheory.io. And we're always hiring in really unique capacity, minimum five hours a week, work anytime you want, uh, similar to open source type project. Um, and the roles that we're looking for are front-end developers, back-end in Golang or .NET Core, uh, and of course, Kubernetes DevOps engineers. All right, uh, thanks I, very much. Awesome, thanks buddy. And I got a little bit of choppiness on my side. I'm not sure if that was just locally, but just in case everybody saw that, uh, what, what Lauren said is that they are going into a beta release and they're looking for users to, to help with testing and discovery. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Uh, awesome. Cool. I just want to make sure that gets on the record. I'll put uh, a little then, summary in the notes. Awesome. Perfect. I'll make sure to include that in the show notes as well. Thanks. And then we've also got a uh, an announcement from another local startup, Spaceship, uh, and I'll hand over to Tim for that. Hey. Um, so I am getting started with uh, what I'm calling Spaceship 2.0, um, kind of rebooting the company a bit. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, I've been working on building up a uh, continuous delivery as a service product. So what I'm looking to do is connect the dots between like, I've written some code on my laptop and I want to get that in front of customers. Um, we're basically building two separate products um, that kind of join together and I answer those questions. So one of those is the magic container registry. Um, that is uh, basically a container registry you hook up to your GitHub repos. You click the button, hook it up, um, and then it will automatically build your code into a container image. No Docker files, no, never any YAML, <laughs> please, no YAML, uh, no other configuration languages, no tooling installs, none of that stuff. Just click a couple buttons. Um, I'll include a link in the chat uh, to a Loom demo video of me like running through the prototype version of this. Um, you'll notice that I click a button, I think three times, and then I get a container image. Um, that's fully runnable and has all the stuff in it. Um, so that's kind of one piece. And the second piece is uh, the uh, continuous delivery um, engine, 
which will connect, okay, I've got this container image, how do I actually get that onto my cluster? Um, and that's the agent that will make that happen. Um, think of it like a, you know, very advanced version of a uh, kubectl set image. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, with more rules and, um, you know, the ability to customize how it works. Um, again, I'm super duper early. So what I'm actually looking for now is I, I have nothing to sell. Um, I have nothing worth buying. <laughs> so what I'd love to do is just talk to people. Um, I'll include a link to my Calendly. Um, if you want to just sign up and talk to me for as little as like 15 minutes, that would be so helpful to me. Um, I'd love to just hear about how you're doing delivery. I don't want to like, I don't want to talk. I want to hear you tell me what your problems are. Um, so I can learn about the space more um, and make sure I'm building towards like what people actually want versus what I think they want. Um, you know, again, these products are what I'm thinking is right, but I might not be right. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, not hiring or anything like that. It's literally just me right now. So, um, but I am looking for my intro to customers, my RFC request for customers. Um, and yeah, I'll include the links to that, um, to uh, Paper Street, where I do weekly updates uh, about what's going on in the company, which is a good way to keep track of how I'm going on with, you know, things. It's very fast paced. Um, I've only been working this for two, three weeks, um, and I've already got a prototype demo, and I'm planning to have something like usable by other people by, you know, two weeks from now. So um, it's very, very, very quick, which is good. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity to mention this stuff. I'll put a lot of this stuff in the chat, though. Awesome. Cool. And we'll make sure to uh, take those links you post and put them in the show notes. So there you go, folks. You heard uh, 15 minutes of free therapy. Tell, tell Tim your problems for 15 minutes. All you have to do is follow a Kenley link. Uh, cool. Before we move on, as always, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, SalesLoft, for uh, providing the Zoom webinar and then happier times for adding us with a, a place to have our meetings and fun things like being beer and pizza. Absolutely looking forward to getting to do that again. Um, so as we move into having our speakers talk, make sure you use the, uh, the Q and A feature in zoom. If you have uh, questions, go ahead and post them there. And then Joe and myself will, uh, grab those questions and interject to our speakers and let them know uh, what your question is. And we'll try to get them answered, uh, live from the speaker as they're, uh, working through their talk. You don't have to save them to the end. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and introduce my good friend, Moshe Shipman, who's a senior engineer at Sysdig, and he's going to be talking to us about a simple GitOps workflow. All right. Thanks for the intro. Hey, everyone. Uh, so my sh screen sharing. Let me play here. All right. So just making sure. Can everyone see the sharing? All right. Cool. So, uh, yeah, what we're going to be talking about today is... Uh, a simple CI, CD, and GitOps workflow in action. Um, we're going to be combining the well-known CI, CD flow of a containerized API service um, running on Kubernetes, of course. And we're going to uh, combine that with a GitOps um, setup. We're going to talk about the GitOps uh, methodology for a little bit. Um, in that approach, we're going to have the apps manifests also stored in our Git repo. And we're going to get those applied automatically. Uh, we're going to show how, uh, how we can manage that. Um, the purpose of our demo today is not to deep dive into the variety of, uh, of options uh, you know, for applying GitOps, but we're just going to scratch the surface. We're going to give you all um, a welcoming intro to the process. If you've always wondered about what GitOps is and uh, you know, just didn't have the time to meddle with it. So uh, let's get started. All right, so what is GitOps? Um, the term are, yeah, I, I should say the term was first introduced uh, to the world by uh, Alexis Richardson, the CEO and co-founder of, uh, of Weaveworks. Uh, that was through a blog post in 2017, and we have the link here. Um, essentially what it is, GitOps means that you store all your infrastructure configs. Uh, it could be case resources, it could be Terraform, it could be Ansible, uh, whatever you use for your infrastructure code or anything else. Um, in a declarative form, uh, you have to store those in Git. That's one of the principles as well. Uh, you manage them in a, in a Git fashion or a VCS fashion where, you know, pull request collaboration, all that stuff. Um, and the changes are applied automatically to your underlying infrastructure. So as I stated previously, there are many different ways uh, to implement GitOps in your environment. Uh, it, it, it can really be anything as long as it consists of the main principles. Uh, the four main principles, and if you go through that blog post, you will see them. 
everything should be declared, described in a declarative fashion. Uh, I know Tim said he doesn't like YAMLs, but unfortunately it has to be something like YAML where you actually say like, uh, what does your infrastructure consist of? Uh, the desired state should be stored in Git quite in a similar fashion of where you know, you have your Kubernetes manifests, which consist of your desired state of, of your application. So this needs to be stored as Git. Um, and then when you get through the approval process and actually merge your pull request with the infrastructure changes, those, those can be applied automatically without human intervention. And the last principle is that you should have some sort of a reconcil reconciler that can also ensure that your um, desired state is also the current state. So it ma makes sure that the correctness um, uh, of, of your uh, infrastructure and it acts upon any sort of divergence. It, you can either alert for, for it or you can also set it to self-heal. Um, so uh, some examples of applying GitOps, like we said, are Kubernetes manifests using something like Argo CD, which we'll talk about today. Uh, Terraform modules, you can use something like Atlantis to apply your uh, modules, things like that. Um, your Ansible configs, if you have those, you can use something like Tower or AWX, which is the open source version of it. Um, so these are the simple examples. And as I said earlier, today we're just going to scratch the surface. We'll be going through a very simple setup just to get you guys an idea of what it is. We're going to use, uh, we're going to apply GitOps by just storing our Kubernetes application definition. Uh, once you get the gist, though, uh, applying the same principles to every other type of infra code or whatever should be rather simple. Um, okay, so as far as the benefits go, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward, but uh, it enables a more developers uh, like centric approach to manage your infrastructure. I like the idea of uh, being, you know, storing everything in a declarative fashion. Um, the, the obviously better versioning, collaboration, uh, thanks to Git. Um, you know, you can have a PR of like, hey, I want to change our infrastructure. And like I said, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be Kubernetes. So I'd say, hey, I don't know, you want to introduce a new uh, Route 53 DNS record. You're going to store that through Terraform as a PR. And then you're going to have your team members review that. Make sure that you don't have any, I don't know, typos, fat finger errors, that sort of stuff. Um, and the, the, the other benefit of it is even if you did make a mistake that was overlooked by your uh, peers that reviewed the PR, a simple revert PR could just undo the change. So that's another benefit of storing that st stuff in Git. Um, you have a single source of truth, which is always useful and, and very helpful. And I'm sure we've all been through the uh, pains of the past where you can have more than one source of truth. You're going to try and apply a change in one way, and you're, you're going to see that being undone by something else. Uh, a, a bad, a sore memory that I have from it is Puppet, for example, uh, where you would have, I don't know, a manifest uh, that you try to, I don't know, go, to, go hop on a server, try to change a service configuration. Puppet's going to undo your change in 15 minutes when it runs, and then you're like, what happened here? So having a single source of truth is really helpful. And yeah, let me, when, wh what more do you need? Um, okay, so um, now we're gonna start talking about the demo. Uh, the slides are gonna be uh, super short. We're gonna, we have just, uh, I think two more slides and then we're gonna hop on the demo. So uh, as for what we're doing today, we have a super basic Go API. Um, it just have a simple slash version endpoint, nothing fancy about it. Uh, it's stored in my public uh, GitHub repo if y'all wanna go and check, uh, take a look at it. Uh, like I said, the code is stored in GitHub and the case configs as well are stored in GitHub. Um, um, we are templating the uh, Kubernetes configurations using Customize. We're going to talk about that in a bit as well. Um, the deployment process, so the CI CD flow of things, we use GitHub Actions where we build, tag, and push the image uh, to the public Docker Hub for that matter, but we can all obviously use a private Git re uh, Docker registry if we wanted to. Uh, we're going to have uh, the last step of our GitHub Actions workflow to actually make a commit to the same repo just to update the uh, image tag. We're going to use the Git SHA as our image tag, and then we're going to point the, uh, the, uh, the uh, image to the new tag that we just committed. And then the, uh, it's important to state that the GitHub Actions workflow does not watch for changes on the Kubernetes manifest. This is going to be handled by Argo CD, where we're going to go, uh, go over and cover again shortly. 
And lastly, as we said, our GitOps um, uh, workflow, we're using Argo CD for that. It's connected to the GitHub repo. It watches it for changes automatically. And as soon as our relevant um, uh, config has changed, we're gonna see how that gets applied automatically. Um, so yeah, one, one final thing that I wanted to uh, bring up. Um, I know that there's the, well, it's, it's really bad to store your secrets in Git, right? Because uh, we, we've seen how, um, you know, how the consequences can go bad and uh, the white food would back me up here. Um, so th there's a handful of like good options to avoid storing your secrets in Git repo, but if you have to do it, make sure that you encrypt them. Base64 is not encryption, it's, it's just encoding. So anyone can take a Base64 uh, string and uh, decode it. You don't have to have like a, I don't know, a, a, an encryption key or whatever. It's uh, really easy to do that. So uh, for our demo, we're gonna use uh, Bitnami seal secret. Um, I, I think it's a really sleek tool. It has two, um, two different components. One is a server side controller and then you have a client side called kubeseal uh, where you would use to actually um, encrypt your secrets. Um, I like that because it works well with Argo CD and we're gonna see that also. So I just wanted to throw in a quick word about that. Um, there's also a quick gotcha there uh, during the demo. I'll, um, I hope I'll remember to talk about that quick gotcha, but um, there's an, uh, a flag that we have to add to the um, um, seal secret controller on the cluster side to make sure that it updates the status of seal secret. Um, this is something that uh, occurred due to a bug with uh, seal secret. They had to shut it down. And then in the uh, last release they had, they fixed it they didn't um, include that update status flag as well, but we're gonna talk about that in, in a, during the demo and I'll show you the uh, PR and everything. Uh, all right, so time for the live demo. So let's hope the demo gods are with me today. Um, all right, so let me switch my sharing to my smaller screen. So that would be easier. All right, so now I need to hide this thing, sorry. Bear with me while I uh, do some zoom magic. All right, so, okay, so hang on, let me actually find my, sorry, my keynote's gone. Apologies on that. Okay, here we are. So, okay. So let's start by uh, real quick looking at our code. Like I said, Really simple, nothing fancy about it. It's it's just um, I'm, I'm using uh, Jin as the uh, web framework for Go for my REST API. We have just a slash version endpoint that when you hit it, it returns the version. So right now, if I'm gonna go to my QA environment, I'm just gonna hit that. Um, that's it. Just returns the version, nothing else. Um, okay. As far as generating the uh, manifest, we're gonna talk about customize. Um, customize is well known at this point, but it's still something that um, I, I, I find myself, uh, I know that customize and Helm are always in like, uh, you can either use them both or you can pick one. I, I like customize better to be honest. So uh, if you're going over our manifest here um, and you know what, I'm actually, I think that it's gonna look better if we do it from here. Okay, so here's our uh, Git repo. We have our Kate's um, directory here, which stores all our manifests. With customize, it works in a way where you have your base template and then you can um, like create overlays um, or overrides for your base templates. So uh, our base is gonna be the shared config. So let's say you have more than one environment. In our case, we're gonna have a QA environment and a production environment. To avoid the idea of, you know, or I should say to better apply principles of uh, don't repeat yourself DIY, uh, Customize does it really well because you can have all the shared uh, configs, things like, I don't know, you're going to use the same deployment eventually, but with some um, differences, like a different image tag and things like that, uh, you can use the same manifests and then with your overlays, um, you can start like overriding things based on the environment that you look at. So, for example, well, let's start off by looking at the customization file. Really simple. Again, YAML, 
here you're going to specify like which resources are going are going to be relevant for all the uh, all the files that uh, use it. And then common labels is another nice thing that you can do with customize. And that's just an example for us to go check out customize.io. You can see all the other type of configs, but this is for example, I want these labels to get applied to everything um, that, um, you know, to every component that I apply using my, um, so basically to every one of these, we're gonna add these labels automatically. So I don't have to specify them in each of the manifests. Um, Next up, um, so for example, the deployment, it's, it's the same deployment manifest and then we're gonna look at the override. So I'm not gonna look at that. Um, real quick, we talked about sealed secrets. So here's how it looks like. Sealed secret is actually a custom resource on Kubernetes side. Um, the nice thing about it, it's just a YAML like anything else, but your secret, and this is just you know a, a dumb um, a dummy password that I created. It's encrypted. So even if someone does get hold of that manifest, they still need to get your um, uh, your private key to decrypt it. So either they should have access to your cluster with privileges to the cube system namespace, because this is where you store your certificate by default, unless you decided to use a different namespace. Um, so that that's uh, the the whole idea of sealed secrets. And then if we're going over overlays. Uh, here we have like the different environments. And for our demo, we're gonna use the same cluster to different namespaces. We are gonna have a namespace for QA and namespace for prod. Uh, so we're gonna look at QA. Here we can see how we have the namespace definition. It's just um, a namespace manifest. And then um, our customization file here, this is where we have some sort of a cooler magic that customize does. So customize here, we say in the resources definition, take everything you have from base, apply that here, uh, with your customization magic that we're going to see here uh, in a minute, but essentially namespace is a newer is a new resource that we have introduced because we don't want the QA namespace applied from the main. We want QA namespace to belong to the QA environment, and then uh, we have a config map that we're going to look at. Here we're going to do a, a strategic merge, so essentially it's just like doing kube control apply, uh, but our config map just has one additional. Uh, um, environment variable, nothing fancy about it, but I just wanted to show how it's done. Um, and then next up, our images, this is where I talked about, you know, how you can patch your image. Um, so in this case, we have the image name API. So if I'm, if I'm gonna go back to the base and look at the deployment, we're gonna see here that the image name is API under um, this thing, right? Line 22. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna take, that image of API and replace it with whatever you put in your overlay. So if I go to QA, we're gonna see here that the new image is actually going to my uh, uh, Docker Hub repo and the image is, uh, the, the, the repository is called basic go API QA and this is the latest new tag that we have. So it's gonna apply that when it generates the manifest. And then we have a couple of other uh, patches here where here we're gonna uh, mess with the ingress because what we're gonna do, because we have uh, uh, our ingress, basically we wanna use the same ingress manifest for both QA and uh, production and they have different URLs. This is where we actually patch the URLs to say, hey, uh, for my paths and for the, the TLS secrets, cause I have like, um, I use Let's Encrypt to generate the certificates there. Um, so I create also the, um, the TLS certificate and the path I do them both through my overlay, uh, from, from my QA overlay. And this is where I say, hey, that's the target, uh, the ingress named Kate's Meetup API. This is where you're gonna do that patch. And this is JSON patch, uh, nothing customized related. It's just uh, you know, a more known thing. Uh, another thing we do here is we add the namespace um, as that we talked about. And lastly, yeah, so the sealed secret, sorry. This is uh, the last thing that we patch here is the sealed secret. We're saying that, um, we are going to add our secret to the QA namespace uh, because uh, we want that secret to get applied there. Um, the, the way, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, sealed secrets, the way it works as the controller. So when we apply this to our cluster, you see, we don't have a namespace here, but let's say I'm going to create um, that sealed secret. I'm gonna apply that to my cluster. What's gonna happen is the sealed secrets controller, it's gonna get that custom resource 
And it's going to create a native Kubernetes secret out of it in the same namespace that the sealed secret uh, was applied in. And it's going to do that with owner references, which is really cool. So that if you delete the sealed secret, it's going to delete the secret as well. So there's a, there's a direct relation between the sealed secret and the actual secret that gets supplied in the cluster. Um, yeah, so these are uh, our manifests. And uh, I guess real quick, I can probably show how we're going to do these. So if I go, let me see, I think I'm in the, okay. So if I go to my uh, case overlays QA folder, and this is the same place that we were in, all I have to do right now from all the um, special customization things that you saw is if I run customize builds and I hit enter, these are the generated manifests that would essentially get applied to my cluster with all the patches, with everything that happened through it, customize build. And there you go. You have everything as you have decided. So for example, you know, the seal secret, we thought we said that we're going to patch the namespace. So we're going to see here that my namespace in QA, by the way, uh, can you guys see the code fine? Should I zoom in a little bit or is that okay? Okay, let me hit command plus a couple of times. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, okay, is it better? It's fine for me, but that's definitely better. Okay, uh, let me do that again because I think it went too far. All right, so we can see, for example, the ingress as we talked about the host that is going to get patched and all that. So um, like I said, customize builds and you have your uh, templates uh, generated and then obviously you can pipe that into Kube Control Apply and you're done. So um, yeah, this is that. Um, Next up, we're going to talk about our GitHub Actions workflow and what's going to happen there. So we have one workflow called we call that CI/CD, but um, essentially the last part of it is to apply the um, the new image tag. So a real quick important note about uh, best practices, and since we're going with Argo CD, um, it's important for me to to state that. From Argo CD's best practice approach, they're saying that you, you would usually not want to store your Kubernetes manifests and your code in the same repo, because there are several different reasons. One could be the fact that, let's say you have your, I don't know, DevOps or SRE team that handles all the Kubernetes manifests, but then developers run your code base and you don't always want to give your developers access to actually change the infrastructure definitions. It varies. I've, I've been in places where develop, we, we would let developers manage their own Kubernetes manifests as well with guardrails in place, things like OPA um, or another good tool that my friend Joe here uh, maintains is Magtape. Um, so th there are you know, other tools in place where you can still do that. For the purpose of our demo, I stored everything in the same repo. The reason that I'm mentioning it is one of the other main reasons where Argo CD are saying it's not a good practice to do that is for the reason where you may end up in an infinite loop where imagine that you have your GitHub Actions workflow trigger on every push to your branches, right? Say QA or main for our purpose. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a code change. That code change is gonna run that uh, workflow. And then essentially the last step of our workflow is doing a commit to, um, to the same repo to update the image tag in our case, in our customization file. This could potentially trigger another workflow to run which would build another image. And then it's going to keep happening and you're going to find yourself in an infinite loop. Why am I bringing this up? It's really useful to do. If you do store your case manifests in the same place, make sure that you ignore uh, the manifest changes from your GitHub Actions workflow because Argo CD watches your GitHub repo anyway. It's going to see when you have a change to your customization files and it's going to apply them accordingly without the need for your GitHub Actions workflow. Um, so make note of that if you do uh, you know, find yourself in this weird in, uh, infinite loop situation. Remember that this is a, a really like useful gotcha to do. And obviously, README is something that I don't care for. So if I updated my README, I don't want to build a new code for that. Um, so. Just a basic streamlined CI CD flow. We're going to check out the code, uh, setting up Docker build, setting up customize, uh, log into Docker Hub with my, uh, with my uh, secrets there. And then this is relevant only for QA. And you see how I have that nice if statement here to say uh, only if this is the QA branch, then you're going to run this step. GitHub Actions 
I, I really like that. It's, it's really simple to understand. It's really powerful. It's got a lot of things that you can do. The nice thing, even with your free GitHub account, you still have, I think, uh, I believe 20 or 40 hours a week, uh, or sorry, a month where you can run your actions uh, on GitHub's hosted runners. So uh, you can use them even that you don't have to pay for that. Um, so it's really useful for our purpose. And um, here we can see that we built the image and then we pushed it. We're using the Docker build and push action. Uh, and lastly, this is where we say, okay, so our we're in the QA branch. I'm just making sure that I'm in QA branch. We're checking it out. I'm going to the QA folder. I'm doing the git config to use the GitHub Actions user. And then I'm doing customized edit here, which I'm saying set my image to the new GitHub SHA that I just built for my commit. And then I'm catting it to make sure that it did work. And then I'm committing my, uh, my change and I'm pushing it to the QA branch. We have the same step exactly just for prod. So a bit different as far as like the image that we build, we're going to a different repository this time. This one doesn't have the QA um, abbreviation, oh, sorry, uh, concatenation. And then the rest is pretty much the same. Um, yeah, so that's our CI CD workflow. And, um, then we're going to talk about Argo CD real quick. So Argo CD, um, it's again, something you apply in your cluster. It has a, its own namespace and, uh, there's a lot you can do with it. You can, uh, it supports things like single sign-on using your external OAuth providers. I think things, things like Okta and you can use GitHub Auth and whatnot. So there's a lot of things you can do with Argo CD. Uh, I'm not going to go everything. They have pretty good documentation. Um, with examples and, and you know, best practices, like I mentioned and everything else. Uh, it has a really nice UI. If you're, I'm, I mean, I'm usually, I like to be more like on, on terminal type of person, but I don't know why I find myself really, I'm more attracted to doing things on the UI just because I find it really easy to handle. Uh, but if you want to do everything, like obviously you can do everything through YAML. So if you want to at this point, you can even manage your Argo CD manifest in a GitOps fashion if you want to take it as far. So uh, we're going to use the UI today, sorry for the uh, terminal uh, profane folks. Um, so here, what we have right now is the instance, the QA instance, which I um, set up ahead of time. Uh, we can look at how it's defined real quick, but the nice thing, it even like, this is where the part where I don't use the UI, but you can still use it to see all the relevant resources that get applied from your app. So this is what Argo CD called in a custom resource fashion, an application. Uh, so that's a custom resource. And it's eventually all your Kubernetes native resources, things like config maps, services, ingresses, all of these would get tied into that application and that would um, drill down to the same place. So uh, we can see their ingress here. We have our sealed secret. That's a nice thing that uh, I like to see about Argo. It, it, it can even watch your custom resources and identify those. Um, um, and then we have our deployment, we have our service, uh, namespace and so on, because all of these are manifests that get applied from, from our customization. And then we can see all the way down to endpoints, endpoint slices, replica sets. And then if we uh, keep going here, we'll see the pods. We see our certificates, secrets, all that sort of stuff. So you have a pretty solid, you know, um, um, overview of what's going on. And obviously, you can edit your manifests here. You can see diffs of, you know, the last changes that occurred and all that stuff. So uh, you can get a lot of info from the UI if you prefer to. Um, so yeah, that's the app as far as the definition goes. And this is a nice thing. Um, if you want, you can have Argo CD, like the same instance, manage um, additional clusters, not just the one that it runs on. Obviously, it's going to have to have access to the API of the other cluster. You're going to have to give it like, you know, cluster admin access and all that stuff. Uh, I just use it in cluster in that case. Our app runs in the QA namespace, like we said. Uh, this is the Git repo that we have, and the target revision is basically the branch that we look at. And Argo CD um, supports customize out of the box. You can either use customize or Helm for your templating. Uh, like I said, I like customize better. So uh, you can edit the path and you can tell it here, okay, wh where's, the, where's the path that you're gonna use customize build to generate it from? And we're gonna see that in a minute. Um, and then this is the URL that gets generated from the ingress. This is the image that runs right now. And we have like auto sync and self heal that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Auto sync is 
Um, this is where you tell Argo CD, hey, when you identify a change on the Git repo, go ahead and apply that to our um, to our um, uh, cluster. And then self heal is another one. Remember when I uh, mentioned from the GitOps principles where you have to have some sort of a reconcile loop to other correct any divergence from your desired state, or uh, if you want to alert upon it. So I picked the for for, the, for this demo I picked the self heal, which says if I if you identify something that it does not match the desired state, go ahead and auto correct it yourself. And we're going to show how, for example, I'm going to scale up using Kube Control my deployment and Argo CD is going to revert that scale up because it doesn't match the same replica account that we want to see. Um, so that's just one example. Uh, okay, so let's let's see this whole thing in action. Now, what we're going to do next, we're going to create a, uh, a prod instance of our app. So uh, we're going to see how easy it is. So we're going to click a new app here. We're going to call this one uh, to match the name. So this one called, uh, it's called Kate's Meetup API. So we're going to call this one um, Kate's Meetup API prod. Uh, we're going to use the default project. The sync policy is there where we're going to see the, uh, the automatics. So that's auto sync. That's the self heal that we talked about earlier. Um, and now the next thing we're going to do, the repository URL, we already have our uh, repo here. So we're going to point to that. The revision we want to look at, uh, we're going to look at manches, uh, branches and we're going to point it to the main branch here. Uh, because this is our production for that matter. And then it automatically finds the paths that are relevant for us uh, where it sees like Kubernetes manifest. We're gonna to point to the prod one this time. Um, the cluster URL is gonna be the default one that we have. And we can leave that empty, I think, because this would actually create the prod namespace for us. Uh, and this is where we say we should use either customize Helm or anything else that we wanna use. I use customize. Uh, I don't really modify anything here. Hang on, my Zoom towel is in my way. Let me get that out of here. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's the image. And once we're done, and obviously we can edit it as a YAML, like I said earlier, once we hit create, we're gonna have that happen. And at this point we created, it's already out of sync, but right now it's progressing. So if I'm gonna go to my cluster uh, and we are going to, oh, sorry. Uh, Cops is messing with me. Okay, so Google Control, get an S. And we should see a production namespace created. We see 22 seconds ago. And if we go to the prod get, uh, let's say get all. So we're gonna see a pod already running 29 seconds ago. We see a service uh, and we see a deployment. And also if we, uh, go to prod and get ingress, we're going to see our ingress here. So I've already pre-created the, um, the uh, DNS record to point to it. Uh, but if we are going to go, let me get this out of here again. So let's take the ingress URL, which is this guy. And we're going to go to our browser and get to the version endpoint. We're going to see that we have version 001. Now, there we go. All we did is just added an application here. We already see that it's in sync. We have our prod instance. Um, next thing we're gonna do, a really quick PR uh, to just bump the version up. We're gonna do, do we're gonna do that in a very simple promotion flow. Right now we are on the QA branch. Let me actually make sure that I'm on the QA branch. I am, okay. So get status and we're gonna get add main.go. We are, oh, okay, the Zoom panel is in my way every time, sorry. Uh, so git commit and bump version, bump version. And we are gonna git push that into QA right now. Um, and as soon as we do that, we're gonna see our GitHub Actions workflow kick off. So let's go back to our repo and we are going to switch branches to QA. We're gonna see that we have a workflow running already and let's go through it. It should be rather fast. Um, Alex, how am I in time, by the way? You're fine, buddy, don't, don't stress on it. Cool, thank you. Uh, okay, so we watched the uh, YAML definition. Now we can see the whole thing in action. Now we see here that the QA image is the one that matches because our branch is QA and it matched our if condition that, were, that we went through earlier. Um, so it's gonna do that. It's building the image 
think it's almost done. Step seven. Okay, this is done. It's pushing our new image right now. Okay, and we can see that it skipped the build and push for prod and the update gets in secret prods because it, it didn't match our condition of the branch name. Um, oh, oh, okay, the log was not found. So this happened. Now we're gonna switch back to our Argo CD and we are going to, uh, looks like it didn't sync yet. So uh, a, a quick gotcha that I can mention if you are interested in that, you can configure your Git repo to send a webhook to your Argo CD instance as soon as, uh, as, soon as it's done. Um, I didn't wanna do that. Argo CD has its own, uh, I think every 30 seconds or so, it checks to see what's going on. And now we can see, by the way, I think it already happened while I was talking. Uh, so our QA instance, last sync result was a few seconds ago. Okay, so it already happened. Uh, that was too fast for me. Let me go control minus NQA, get pods. Yep, we have a new pod 27 seconds ago. So if I'm gonna switch back to my QA instance and I'm gonna refresh here, I have the new version. That was really fast, right? Uh, and of course we can apply the same promotion approach where, okay, so it passed QA. My engineer said, hey, okay, you're all good. We're all set to go with this to production. Then we can just go back to our um, main branch here. We're going to switch to QA and then we're gonna create a pull request. Um, oh, by the way, actually, before I do that, um, let's uh, check the last commit that we see here is the actions user that we talked about, the GitHub actions user. This is where it actually bumped the image tag to, uh, to a real image. Uh, this, oh, that's sorry, that's on the main branch. So this is an older one. Um, so if I'm on the QA, yeah, this is the most recent commit, two, minute, two minutes ago. And this is where we can see that it updated from the previous image to the new one. So now we're gonna go back to our QA branch and we are going to make a quick pull request from QA to main um, to say, uh, I don't know, we'll call that bump version. And we're gonna create our pull request. We see that two changes are actually applied here. The QA image, which we don't care for because our production instance is not gonna watch for these changes anyway. And then that's our version that we are uh, returning. So creating my pull request, I'm gonna merge it right away because I don't um, have any uh, branch protection rules. Obviously you can have things like, um, um, I know that open policy agent, for example, has something um, which is called, gee, I forgot about uh, what it's called right now. It'll come back to me in a second. Um, Conf test. OPA, OPA has this concept of where you can use con, a conf test to validate your YAMLs. You can generate your own configs with Rego uh, as your language, for example. And then you can say, hey, it has to have, I don't know, this set of labels. And this is where we talked about the guardrails for your info definitions. So you can do things like that. Okay, so we bumped our version right now. So our production instance should get updated uh, pretty fast. Let's go back to our applications and let's see if our production got updated. So that was uh, synced six minutes ago. Uh, if we, if you are impatient, you can hit the refresh button here and you're gonna tell Argo, hey, go check in GitHub if there's a new change. It already found it, synced it a few seconds ago and we can see how fast it was just because it's easy. We can see the pod rolling in here because we were fast enough. So we see that this pod was created a, new seconds ago, a few seconds ago. And if we're gonna go back to our production instance, which was returning 001, we are now at 002. Um, another cool thing that I wanted to show, and this is gonna be even faster. Let's say I wanna scale up my application, right? So um, I am right now, let's go to the QA branch and we're gonna get deployments. We see that our meetup has just one uh, replica, right? And remember we talked about the reconciliation loop. Let's say that I wanna scale my deployment right now. Um, and we're gonna to go to the Kate's meetup and do that. So actually let's, let's go wild, let's scale up to seven pods. Uh, once we've done that, let's get the deployment. Oh, what happened? I'm back to one. Cause Argo CD caught me straight away saying, hey, you cannot scale your pods directly on your cluster. If you wanna scale up, you gotta do that in your Git state. This is where you always have to match your desired state. So if you wanna scale up, 
This could be a bit of a hassle. And like I said, um, you can take the approach of alerting rather than self-healing if you want to. But let's say that I wanna scale up right now. So I'm gonna to go to my Kate's manifest here. Um, that's, that's actually a tricky one. The replicas, um, okay, I haven't thought this through. I should have prepped for it. The bad thing that's gonna happen right now if I do that here is if I update the base, uh, actually, well, no, if I do that on the QA branch, it's still gonna only apply to QA. So let's go with that approach. Um, so I'm gonna use this cause it's just faster. Um, so I am on the QA branch, right? Yeah, okay. So let's say that we wanna scale up to four pods right now. And we are gonna say, uh, add more pods. And then we are gonna commit directly to the QA cause we're bold and we don't need a pull request. Um, and now, we might need to give it a minute for Argo CD to pull that. Like I said, this is where the webhook could get useful, uh, but we don't have to, because if we wait long enough, it's gonna happen anyway. Uh, but let's refresh and let it sync. And here is what happens. We have our new pods coming up. We have four pods and here they are. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, like I said, we're, we're only scratching the surface of what you can do with GitOps and uh, the idea of Argo CD. I think it's really cool. Uh, I, 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 I didn't talk enough about Argo CD. Um, I'm pretty sure, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's part of the CNCF. Um, um, it's a CNCF sponsored project. Uh, I think it graduated um, already. I'm not sure. I think it's graduated. Uh, either way, it's got a good amount of support uh, as far as community goes, their documentation are solid. Um, I've heard of people that already use it in production. So it's it's pretty mature enough to be used. Okay, we got Andy here. Um, so yeah, there's a lot we can do about. Um, and I know that we heard uh, in, during the last meetup, uh, Joe brought up the, uh, I think it was the last meetup, they had this uh, whole um, exploit where you could use uh, arbitrary code to actually, you know, start mining bitcoins on your cluster and whatnot. So, um, in, I, I guess it's useful to say my, my UI is locked down only to my IP address. No one can actually access that UI right now, even if you try. Um, don't 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 expose your your UI to the public, even if you use the UI. Make sure that you lock it down as much as possible. Same as your treat treat it the same way you would use um, your Kubernetes API. Don't make it public because you never know, like it's, it's better to just lock it down at the network level and not let anyone try to use an exploit that no one found yet. So um, yeah, I guess that's, that's uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. There aren't any petting at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think we're, I think that, that wraps us up. All right, appreciate the awesome. attention guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Moshe. That was awesome, man. Good talk as always, buddy. All right. Um, so next up, <clears throat> sorry, for me, we have Andy Holtzman, who's an engineer at Equinix Metal, and they will be speaking about lessons learned from Equinix's uh, Kubernetes migration. So please welcome Andy. All right. So let me see if I can do this correctly. Let's start that screen share. And then find where it went. There it is. Share that. It goes over to there. Cool. So you guys can see my very plain slides. Great. <clears throat> um, so I didn't really, I don't have a demo, but I'm happy to walk through our end state. It looks a lot like uh, what Moshe just showed. We use uh, Argo with a whole, we introduced our own layer of templating on top of Helm to produce at what's called app of apps in Argo so that we have applications that then deploy the rest of our applications, but then we have a layer on top of that. So we just really love templating. And uh, what we do with that is, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but instead of some of the frustrations you end up with Helm is there's a lot of shared values that people fat finger all over the place. So with our like overarching layer of templating, we actually provide like What's your cluster of QDN? Where can you find the uh, the main API's IP address or the front end address? So like uh, Argo is a it's a fantastic tool. It's actually pretty extensible from either side. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the experience that we had taking 
uh, what was packet to now Equinix Metal from three different container runtime environments and production to one. So for a while we were in four, which did not lead to any additional cognitive load. Everyone slept great and there was no uh, heartburn. So I don't believe you. <laughs> locking in. Oh, oh no. No. Okay. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I might just do this because I don't know. I, I work in Vim. This whole GUI thing is new. All right, so we're just going to do this. So uh, walking in, we had Rancher Classics. So I mean, like on Rancher OS with Rancher, not, not Rancher with Cube, uh, Hashi Nomad, then actually running K3S. And coming soon was the promise of my team with Kubernetes. Um, like I, I'm sure people here have been through a lot, but uh, the, the worst part about this is actually the burnout from the teams. So teams are tired of deploying to how long it takes to go to Rancher, how long it takes to go to Hashi. Now you want me to learn how to do it on Kubernetes? Like, and we had no shared heritage between Kubernetes and K3S on top of that. Like we came in, with a fresh platform. So the good part is everything's containerized, right? Like we don't have to go through that heartache. Everyone just like, yeah, we have a container. Uh, all the builds are in containers, uh, all on a super old version of drone. So take the wins where you can. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Packet or Equinix Metal is, uh, we provide uh, a cloud-like a cloud -like experience for uh, provisioning bare metal instances. So we provide isolated networking to dedicated hosts through an API. So if you want to set up a pop anywhere in the world, we make it super easy for you. But what that also means is for a while, we thought it was a great idea to use our own API to provision our API. So um, we were pulling from customer IAPAM for the platform IAPAM which definitely never led to instances where we were uh, had IP conflicts between like our API and customer instances that never uh, routed poorly. Uh, there are never instances where you do bulk deprovisions on the API, and then you deprovision the host that's running the API that's trying to deprovision the host that's running the API. Uh, deployments took days. I mean, literally, uh, we would, uh, for being so a relatively new company and having such uh, being on all these relatively modern deployment platforms, people were still stacking releases, doing it on a sprint basis or monthly basis, and they took a day to put it into Rancher, they took a day to put it into Hashi, because even with the CI CD process that was automated through drone, babysitting it, making sure it worked well, verifying health was just painful. Um, and then you had the issue of who was an expert in what stack. So like you couldn't throw the hashy engineer in a rancher facility and hope that they had a good time. Uh, so it's just lots of organizational uh, churn on who we had to call in an incident to like bring the right people in that could verify we were back to an operational status. And then the worst part was the, the sprawl. So we had different load balancer technologies, different firewall technologies, disjoint IDP, definitely inconsistent configuration, artisanally manicured Postgres instances. So people would rec get some Postgres pages, just update the config on the host, and then go to sleep, which made migrations of these hosts amazing because we're trying to figure out what went wrong and doing postmortems on it. And so, but like, uh, some facilities use traffic as the primary ingress. Some facilities use Apache. Some of them were using Nginx. It was really just like on the day the site was turned up, what package did they install and decide to configure? So like, it's just the, again, the, the burden and the operational uh, overhaul. So obviously uh, bringing these three platforms to one has some battles. Um, you have Stockholm syndrome. People are used to the hell they know. They really like it. Um, they, uh, 
for better or for worse, they understand that this facility traffic holds GCPR, G, GRPC connections open indefinitely, while this facility with Nginx doesn't. So we just have scripts to bounce connections in the Nginx facility rather than fix the code to do a proper reconnect. And there's some uh, attachment to technologies, right? People are comfortable with the choices they made and they don't, they're not really a fan of Equinix acquiring a company, providing funding, building out whole new teams to do their job. So, you know, a little bit of that. Um, managers like productive engineers and less complaints. So, you know, when you're moving people from platforms, boy, do they find everything possibly wrong with it. And then they talk about how, well, I couldn't get this done because I had to worry about Kubernetes. I couldn't do this because I had to, I, I had to do a deployment to Cube now. They really loved the addition of more YAML because for everything else, Kubernetes is just light on YAML, as I think most people are familiar with here. Um, and relatively, uh, in a very real sense though, Kubernetes YAML is highly specific, it's pretty verbose, and it's it's just not what they're used to. So when you're coming from um, Hashi, where it's actually done in HCL, but very similar, but much more concise, it feels more intuitive, you, you have a lot of complaints because uh, to uh, Moshe's point, you could do customize, you can do Helm, and people have lots of complaints both ways. Uh, and they also just don't know it. And then you're forced into the Kubernetes way. Um, I, you know, I've really only ever seen about two productive uses of Kubernetes. And one is with ingress to service to pod to work or uh, request, job, schedule, work. And so when you have these other platforms that are a little bit more flexible, uh, there's some re-architecture that has to happen on the platform. There's some, uh, like a platform layer. So like, how, how do you work with RabbitMQ? How do you manage it? How do you monitor it? Um, I think the, the biggest question we got was why Kubernetes? Why isn't what we're doing now good enough? Uh, because what I later found was that this was an organization that had been on everything from Apache Mesos to trying to use K3S on a single host. And I mean, the answer there is pretty simple. It's the community. Um, when everything's open source, you can find your problems. You can figure out why won't what I know a valid Nginx config work on an ingress? Oh, because Kubernetes ingresses do not allow regex in the path or uh, they do now, but when we started, they didn't. Um, <clears throat> you have passionate people. You have people who spend their nights feverishly fixing problems, investigating, and then you just have like this shared interest. So I don't know where everyone on the call works or what they do, but you have all these people in the community who are trying to handle the, pro the same problem for a different purpose. And what you end up with is a really high quality product uh, versus Nomad, which is driven by a single company. So you have to like work within their product framework and their product decisions or K3S for whenever the one guy at Rancher who maintains it updates it. Sorry. Oh, no, don't go away. Sorry about that. Sorry, getting a phone call. It's the one guy who maintains Rancher calling him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's actually my friend who lives in Atlanta. Um, uh, and so you, you know, you when, but the cube community is its own living, breathing thing. <clears throat> so what do you do? What is an engineer to do? How do you how do you take all these people in your own organization who are? Uh, driven by their own product decisions, driven by their own bugs, driven by their own lack of sleep, driven by managers who don't like you or your team, because like we definitely had some passive aggressive problems. Um, you have to do it yourself, right? So like I wrote so many Helm charts for our bespoke applications that make up our platform. And um, like they, they don't want to figure out how to do it themselves but you do have people interested. So like I have this one network engineer 
who now like every morning I wake up to messages from him on Slack about he worked with Calico, he found these benefits, and now he's thinking about contributing to Cilium to try to get ARM built so that in his Raspberry Pi lab at home, he can get Cilium going because he wants to use that uh, for the latest Meta LB features that are now in tree. And so you have these people who are, they're interested in the technology, but they, that's not what they do. Like he primarily works on our software defined networking. And so like, but he wants to make it better. He wants to work with the platform. He wants to figure out how can I set up A-B testing? <clears throat> uh, you have to make it kick ass. Figure out what makes it hard. One of the things we did was took multi-day multi deploys. We made them 15 to 20 minutes through Argo. Like uh, we, so one of the things that makes our overall configuration unique is today we have 50 production clusters that are all about six nodes. We run very small clusters across the globe to manage entire data centers or articulate and provision host in those data centers, right? Most people don't manage 50 clusters. Most people manage three, four, maybe 10, but much larger clusters. So you can imagine when they go from having to manage that same volume with these bespoke written tools to what we saw with Argo. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, like my Argo instance, uh, I can show you actually, since we're all now familiar with Argo. <clears throat> Do, 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 hit the SAML, log in, behind the VPN, very important. Uh, so here is how I'm managing my cockroach DB. So like my projects are all listed this way. Uh, teams have their segmented views. And then because I'm an admin, I see everything, but teams have, we have very unique RBAC structures uh, with you can, or you can look at, I want to see all the applications in this one cluster, which is useful for me as an operator, right? So going from like this world of scripting to a tool like Argo CD blew people's mind. And to this day, we still get people going, wow, that was so fast. Um, and then provide automation. So uh, we're working on open sourcing this project, but like, this is the thing I was talking about before with we have a templating layer on top of everything. Uh, we call it Atlas. It's how we actually define what application with what resources, what configuration, and all these other things will go to what cluster. And then that drives uh, over here in Argo. If I just click on, let's pick, click on something not important, like our API. <laughs> um, hey, Andy, yeah. um, if you could um, bump up the font size in the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Redis operator, that's innocuous, right? So <clears throat> uh, when I say provide automation, what we're doing is we provide all these additional values in the application definition for Argo so that people can write against having this expected cluster info .fqdn to build their application and have their ingress. Uh, or know what the name of the cluster there is, or what tools are available. So this is a large cluster, it has Rook available, and they have alerting turned on. So, um, <clears throat> and then for that, we can convert that into steps taken inside the Helm charts, um, right? And at this point, like, I, I actually feel a little bit bad for anyone where this is their first Kubernetes experience, because if they go somewhere else, they won't have all these facilities. And you have to iterate fast. So we were doing agile scrum meetups uh, when we were a three person team, but basically it was like, yeah, I spent all day with this engineer on this team solving this problem for him. Like our tickets were out the window, our spent velocity was zero. And we just had to do whatever we had to to earn trust because otherwise all the platforms they'd used before were kind of like, well, yeah, we can just have it. We can just deploy hashing there wasn't a dedicated team. And so you had a lot of burn, burned out engineers. You know, we work openly. Um, all of our repos are visible to everyone. We use code owners. We follow uh, some get cleanliness practices. We accept PRs. 
So we let people modify their own infrastructure code. If they want more resources in their namespace, we definitely allow them to do that. Um, and then we uh, leave documentation. Uh, we have an entire like make, stop, make docs site just for people to learn about the platform we provide and how they can use it. Uh, we talk about how we provision clusters openly so people know the process we're going through. And like, I can't emphasize this enough. You have crotchety old engineers who are tired of people telling them VMware is cool, who are tired of VMware-based Kubernetes deployments, who are burnt out on this concept of a platform can be good or it can be helpful. And so you just have to do what it takes. Uh, for example, people didn't trust how configurable Nginx Ingress is. So we have three different instances running on every cluster to satisfy different default configurations because they didn't, they're like, there's no way you can change this based on annotation. That doesn't work. And so like we had some given some take, right? Cause like Nginx Ingress is incredibly flexible, but they need to know that you're there to work with them and support that. Um, and I think the other big thing, like, I don't, I don't really like pay close attention to if I'm doing SRE or DevOps, I try to build a good organization with good concepts from all of it. So it's just about open accountability. You celebrate your wins. When you get a new team brought on and you can show them their metrics, you can show them all these new things they have or uh, like the default alerting they now get out of Cube Prom Stack. They're like, oh, I know when my application goes down and I did nothing. There's, they love that. Uh, when we accidentally deprovision the host that was trying to deprovision itself and that stopped all the deprovisioning of the host, we talked about why did that happen, right? We didn't try to hide it. We didn't work around it or like try to sweep it under the rugs. I mean, we've deprovisioned whole things. We have some very high, we have highly potent Ansible that can like trigger whole reprovisions. And it's important to listen to your customers. Um, I think as Kubernetes enthusiasts, it's very easy for us to get hyper-focused on like, what's the latest cool thing you can get in Kubernetes or what's the, like, what's the ideal state? But like my funding and my job is dependent on having people enjoying to use my platform, having people like having, having those customers, right? So we have to listen to them and we have to run our own little mini product org. And if people um, don't like the complexity of Helm, I have to go in there and make it simpler, right? So, I mean, uh, we stay fairly up to date. We're already deploying 122 and we have clusters as old as 118. So like we have clusters that bleed over that entire ingress stabilization API, which means some people's Helm charts are still on, uh, I forget the old uh, API, right? But before networking uh, went V1. And there are things built into Helm that help support that, where you can check what capabilities does this cluster have and use that in the template. Um, and so adding that maturity into their Helm charts for them, because they're not concerned with how do they deploy their code, though I'd like them to be, I would really like my customers to own it with a passion. Uh, sometimes I just have to give them the helper functions. So um, that's me basically ranting. And I guess I'll open up to q and I see Michael. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, how do we, these, these uh, basic configuration values, right? So like for us, this is the private address for, uh, no, that's actually the Cube API server. Right, so if people want to write against the API server, we have a concept of class, environment, what facility are you in? What's the FQDN of your uh, cluster? Uh, Geo is a newer one that this chart doesn't really need to use. Um, Boots IP, Tinkerbell, right? Because we're working on integrating Tinkerbell into our production environment because it's kind of like our big fancy CNCF project. Uh, so this cluster info is actually the new version of some old legacy stuff. So you'll see some uh, repeat. 
Uh, this is an internal thing that we use for switching between clusters when we do multiple deployments. Um, is Rook available? Uh, thing because like if someone's going to use an empty dir versus declare a PVC, it's actually really hard. Well, I suppose with has capabilities, you could feel that out through what uh, CRD APIs are available. Um, and <clears throat> you, uh, you, you could build it into your helm, but like an if statement is really easy and people like doing that. So, you know, we provide uh, some of these values. Um, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> sorry, uh, just a little bit more about Helm. So like there's a, a Helm, uh, one of the frustrating things about Argo in general, uh, sometimes the speed at which it loads, but um, right, so this is my like production instance. So I have uh, 1500 apps here. So it just takes a little bit of time. Um, but one of the downsides to using customize or Helm is it's actually all handled within the Argo controller. And so for my monitoring uh, application, like there's just no good way to look at this because of all the config maps and all these things. And these are actually being rendered in the uh, server. Uh, and it can just, it can actually slow down your process. So one of the things we're looking at is, uh, right, because like we have bird on all of our hosts, we need to have an exporter to get those metrics. Where do we deploy that? Well, we decided it was easier because of like an order of operations problem to put that when we apply the uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring uh, helm chart. Uh, we have a node exporter that's in here. You have Grafana, you have Prometheus, you have metrics, metric server, an adapter, you have a secret for uh, remote write because we write everything out to a hosted Grafana instance. And like, this is just a massive deployment. And so actually rendering this and applying it does take seven minutes. And it's uh, the only downside to uh, using Customize or Helm versus uh, you could render all of this and commit it back to your repo as flat manifest and then it flies very quickly. That's just a little bit about Argo on my very old 184, not a fancy 211 instance. So. OK, um, I don't see any additional Q&A right now in the chat or anything. So I think with that, um, huge thank you, uh, Andy uh, and Moshe. Great content all around. Um, we'll go ahead and wind things down a bit. Um, but don't go anywhere. We, we have some social time after this usually. But um, again, just want to do a, a call out um, to thank you for our sponsor, Solus Law, for giving us the, um, the, the Zoom and the mechanisms to host these meetups virtually. Thank you to the speakers uh, for coming out, um, continuing to show that we have an awesome community here um, and bringing good content to our local community here in Atlanta. Um, if there's anybody that has a topic that they haven't seen covered so far this year, um, please reach out, let us know, um, either directly in Tech 404 or Kubernetes Slack or on our GitHub repos or on the meetup itself. Um, or if you're interested in spring, um, speaking at uh, one of the future meetups, please reach out and let us know. We always really, really want to have folks from our local community speak when possible. Um, that being said, we haven't announced the date for next month's uh, meetup yet, but that'll be coming soon. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, we will be hanging around for some social time. Uh, so hang around for a little bit. Um, and I think we can close out the recording now. Thanks everybody.